It is such an extraordinary pleasure for me to be here today with an organization that recognizes that all sectors must work together if we are to create that just and sustainable world that each and every one of us seeks. And I want to thank Aaron for his extraordinary leadership to the BSR team and to each and every one of the businesses, the members uh, that are making such a difference in moving us forward. None of us has a monopoly on the competencies and resources that are required for us to truly make progress. But if we work together, solutions are that much more possible. During my time as ambassador, I believe some of the most innovative work that we did at the State Department, whether in creating economic opportunity, uh, in access to technology, or in advancing social progress, in dealing with some of those most intractable challenges. It came significantly through public-private partnerships. And so I want to salute uh, BSR and all of you who share this commitment, uh, recognizing that brands today uh, increasingly understand that an integration of business purpose with the larger purpose of shared value, social impact, is a win-win for how together we have to go forward. I also want to say that it is pure serendipity for me to follow Layla uh, to this podium, because she has been both an innovator and an inspirer in extraordinary ways. And I remember conversations with her uh, in which she described how critically important it is uh, that if much of the world, uh, the poorer parts of the world, and women and youth are to enter into the digital future, they cannot make it unless the opportunities uh, in this new world come to them as well. Uh, and she has done that through Samosource, and in fact, uh, in our book, Fast Forward, uh, she is profiled uh, for the ways that she has demonstrated uh, how one can find purpose, connect with others, and truly make a difference. I believe that if we are to create that resilient future that this conference and so much of your work uh, is devoted to, uh, if we are to create uh, economic growth, uh, to advance social progress, to prevent conflict and insecurity, and so many vulnerabilities, to deal with climate change and all that it represents, we need to unlock the potential of half the world's population. And that means to close the gender gap. In other words, we need to fast forward progress for women and girls everywhere. The book that I wrote with my co-author, Kim Azzarelli, posits that we are at an inflection point. We are at the cusp of a global power shift that can create a more just and sustainable world. If we harness this opportunity, we can improve the human condition everywhere, men and women, and for boys and girls. Today, leaders in government and in the private sector are increasingly recognizing this growing power. There is, and much of it you are familiar with, I'm sure, a plethora of research and data from the World Economic Forum to the World Bank, from the private sector in spades. And this research demonstrates that women today are among the most powerful demographic the world has ever seen, poised to rival China and India as an economic force. The CEO of Coca-Cola, who has been at the forefront of his company's partnerships with women for growth, put it simply, women already are the most dynamic and fastest growing economic force in the world today. Among its commitments, 
Coca-Cola is empowering five million women entrepreneurs by 2020 through its value chain, from agriculture to distribution, to creating small and more vibrant businesses, to recycling. They are transforming the lives of women as entrepreneurs, but also transforming communities in the process. Just a few weeks ago, McKenzie and Company published a global parity report, one of the most comprehensive reports that we have in this space. And they concluded that closing the gender gap could drive between 12 to 28 trillion, that's with a T, trillion dollars in GDP by 2025. Now, we are facing clearly an underutilized economic and social opportunity of unprecedented proportions. But obstacles stand in the way. From discrimination to violence against women, from design flaws in the work world incompatible with caregiving, to the denial of human rights. The World Bank's just released 2016 Women Business in the Law shows that legal impediments to women's economic opportunity remain on the books in 155 countries. 155 economies that could do that much better if they but addressed their discriminatory legal inhibitions. We can't unlock this potential unless we free, fully address these injustices. According to Goldman Sachs, women's entrepreneurship through small and medium-sized enterprises, SMEs, which the World Bank calls that missing middle in terms of economic growth, because of its potential to accelerate growth, create jobs, and inclusive prosperity. And we know that women-owned businesses and enterprises can be a tremendous force in moving forward this kind of growth. Already, women own or lead more than a quarter of the private businesses worldwide. In the United States, if women entrepreneurs were a country, its GDP would rank fifth close to that of Germany. So we are talking about tremendous possibilities and the difference it could make. Furthermore, wealth in the hands of women has a multiplier effect, and we see this the world over. Women tend to plow their income, as small as it may be in some cases, into their families and into their communities raising the standard of living for everyone and creating in this way a double dividend. This is also true for driving growth in companies. An analysis by Catalyst, for example, found that Fortune 500 companies that consistently had three or more female board directors over a five-year period had nearly a 50% higher rate of return on equity. So as Robert Hormat said, this is the law of arithmetic. You cannot afford to marginalize one group, certainly not half of your economy. And yet, as much of, as an obvious point that this is, we still have a long, long way to go. Today, from village markets to boardrooms, Individuals are arming themselves with the data about the business of the benefits of investing in women to shift mindsets, perhaps the hardest thing to do, to change how we think. In some cases, it has meant giving families incentives to send their girls to school, and many companies have been involved in this process. In other cases, it has meant lobbying leading CEOs to take a hard look at the correlation between 
diversity, and greater impact of their companies. Armed with the data, both men and women who are leading companies, countries, and organizations are making the case for putting women at the centers of their strategies. This is true of Prime Minister Abe in Japan, who has recognized, finally, that Japan cannot address its stagflation without enabling Japanese women, who are among the best educated, to move into the formal economy. Womenomics has become a key pillar of his economic reform. But to change companies' behavior, to change cultural behavior, uh, it requires an enormous amount of coming together uh, in ways that can unleash this unlocked potential. When I was ambassador, I discovered in the process of my work that APEC, that organization, Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Platform, that 21 economies in the region belong to, including us and China, had no focus on women and, and the economy in its agenda nor in its work. And despite the fact that statistics showed in an instance of uh, one of the UN reports that at least $90 billion is being lost annually in GDP in the region because the potential of women is not being tapped. Thanks to the efforts of the private sector and government leaders coming together, this has changed in APEC. And in 2011, in this city, the San Francisco Declaration was adopted. And the first ever Women in the Economy Summit was held as part of APEC, which continues to exist with great energy. The APEC conference in the Philippines just concluded last month. I, and it is focused on removing the obstacles to women's entrepreneurship. Obstacles like access to credit, to capital, which is an extraordinarily difficult challenge for most women entrepreneurs. Access to markets, to being able to grow those small and medium-sized business. Access to training and to mentoring. Access to technology. And it has been the coming together of governments in the region economic specialists in the region, and the private sector that is working to create a different kind of income that will grow the economies uh, in these 21 nations. As ambassador, I witnessed the leadership of women who are on the front lines of change everywhere in some of the most difficult places in the world often doing it at great personal risk to themselves. One of the most profound experiences I had one night was in Kabul, Afghanistan, with a small group of women with whom I was to speak. And before we even got started, the first one said to me, stop looking at us as victims and look at us as the leaders that we are. And I have thought long and hard about that ever since, because I've been at a lot of decision-making tables, and all too often in situations of conflict and other kinds of challenging uh, occurrences, women are looked at, at solely as victims, and in many ways they are. But if it begins and ends there, we cannot make the progress that we need to make. She was right, because if we do not incorporate the perspectives, the talents, and the experiences of women, we will not be able to do what justice by them. We will certainly shortchange them, but we are also shortchanging the kind of world we all want to see. Women's participation is also essential to tackling a range of challenges beyond our economic challenges, which is why gender equality and women's empowerment is one of the key integrative goals of the Sustainable Development Goals, those SDGs, 
that were adopted by the United Nations just a month or two ago, and in which so many members of the private sector were engaged, both in the process and now contemplating ways to ensure that these goals can be met. The institute that I direct at Georgetown released two reports fairly recently in short order. One on the role of women in climate. Yes, women are disproportionately affected, impacted by climate change. They are among the most vulnerable. But what is often missing is the next part of that statement, which is they are critical to adaptation and mitigation. It is not enough to talk about the impacts on women. It is clearly important to recognize what can be done to ensure their participation in ways beyond what they are able to do today to really address this common problem. Similarly, in the area of peace and security, women are largely shut out of negotiations to end conflict. Some 9% have ever participated in official peace talks. And yet, unsurprisingly, half the agreements made over the last several years, for example, have been abrogated within five years after those agreements have been signed. As the UN noted, women experience conflict differently, and they are vital to ending it. So these are the kinds of real issues that matter greatly for the vibrancy of economic engagement and ultimately for the kind of world we want to see. So armed with this data, armed with this evidence-based case like we've never had, we know today that this is not just the right thing to do. It is fundamentally that. It is a moral imperative. But it is also the smart and strategic thing to do. And if one isn't persuaded on the basis of the right thing to do, surely we can be persuaded on the fact that this is the smart and strategic thing to do. Another key factor that makes this a moment of fast forward progress is that more women than ever before are in positions of power and responsibility, positions of leadership. And I need only to look at this room for the obvious uh, observation that this is a correct statement, looking at uh, the positions that many of you have today in your companies. And women are using their power to reach out across the sectors, across nations, across socioeconomic strata in an integrated way, not as Layla said, that weekend part of their lives, but that part of their lives that is integrated in everything they are doing uh, in their professional capacities. Forming networks propelled by a shared belief that women and girls can indeed ignite the world. They're also fueled by what we see as that third factor, a fairly obvious one, and that is that technology is enabling us, like-minded people, to connect with each other, to come together for purpose in ways unimaginable even a few years ago. And so the book that I've had the opportunity to be here about today fast forward, is part guide, a guide to enable each of us, wherever we find ourselves, in our companies, in organizations, even in government, to know the power we have, to find the purpose in our work in ways that can be transformative, and to connect with others to create a better world. The book contains a toolkit laying out steps in which to go through that process. And it will be available at the networking break just after this session. It is also part inspiration. It is the stories of more than 70 trailblazing women we interviewed 
some CEOs, some in middle management, some at the base of their societies, uh, who are, each of them, making a difference uh, in fast-forwarding progress for women and girls. And of course, it is about the experiences of my co-author and myself, hers in the corporate sector and the legal sector, and mine mostly in the public sector. And it is the story of so many leaders of companies like those represented here today. Like Walmart, for example, which is using its supply chain to source from women entrepreneurs, in their case, a commitment to women's economic empowerment to source $20 billion over the next five years from women-owned businesses in this country and to double their sourcing overseas. It is companies like Gap who are not only providing the economic opportunity to factory workers, but also training them in personal enhancement and career advancement, which is so important for them to move forward. It is the story of technology companies and what they are doing to close the gender gap in mobile, in internet, in STEM. Such transformative possibilities uh, that they are part of the process of today. And as a result, providing vital health information to people who never could access it before. Uh, enabling the poor to be banked for the first time and to be able to save their income in ways that keep it safe and enable them to transfer, transfer those financial resources. This is what is happening, and I always worry about mentioning a few companies because so many of you, and each of you knows, that you are engaged in this space, which is why it is such a privilege for me to be here today uh, with the best uh, in, in this kind of uh, world where we are together uh, moving forward, both in terms of our own bottom lines, but also in terms of the shared value that represents for social progress. It is the story also of poor women who are part of microcredit networks, uh, from Bangladesh to India and so many places in between, who by coming together through opportunities that have been afforded are unleashing the kind of change uh, in their societies. I want to end with just uh, an excerpt from the book that I think, given the theme of this conference uh, and given the uh, demonstration that wherever we sit in our companies, we can indeed make a difference. Uh, this example, as so many here, buttress that. It is about Kathleen Matthews, who for decades was uh, an extraordinary, successful journalist on television in the Washington area, uh, having won nine Emmy Awards. She found herself being aggressively recruited by the hotel company Marriott International to head its global corporate communications and public affairs. And as she was being interviewed and trying on the part of the leaders of the company to persuade her, she wanted to understand how she could have the social impact in that company that she believed that she had had in her journalistic career. She said that in this role, she and Bill Marriott at the time, who was then CEO, talked about the jobs and careers created by global tourism. She said she had just seen the environmental documentary, An Inconvenient Truth About the Environment, and she told us the following. She said, I asked Mr. Marriott, what is your green policy? And he wasn't sure what I was talking about. We joke about that today, she said. Bill said, my green policy, what do you mean by my green policy? And I said, your sustainability policy. And he said, sustainability, like business sustainability? And I said, no, your environmental sustainability. 
And he said, well, you know, people volunteer to clean up our beaches and our parks around the hotels. And I said, no, but do you have a strategy on global warming? Do you have a strategy for cutting your greenhouse emissions? And he said, your greenhouse gas emissions. And he said, no, but if you come, you can make that happen. She realized that she could be a purpose-driven hotel executive in the same way that she had been a purpose-driven reporter. In the nine years since she joined Marriott as the chief global communications official, she had had many opportunities to pursue the goals that gave meaning to her reporting career. With the support of Bill Marriott and his successor, she developed the company's environmental strategy, which has not only reduced its carbon footprint, but created efficiencies that have accrued to the bottom line. She also developed a global women's strategy, recognizing that female, female business travelers were emerging as a powerful client base. She saw opportunities to engage with women both inside and outside the company. She successfully advocated for more women at the senior levels and on the board, helping to change the face of its leadership. And she worked together with the NGO We Connect to enable Marriott, as other companies have, to source products and services from women-owned enterprises. She told us, I truly believe that if you can tap into a sense of purpose and articulate that, and people see that in you, it can go a long way. And that's what people are looking for, for in their companies. They're looking for people who have a vision for something, a better place, a better outcome. Women are not on this journey alone. Male champions recognize that this is not solely a women's issue. When women make progress, everyone makes progress, and every sector has a role to play. We believe there are few moments in history where forces converge, creating the potential for a transformative leap, a moment when the world can move forward and can move fast. The moment to do that, we believe, is now, if we are willing to seize it. So thank you, BSR, for all that you do, and thank you to each and one of you for all that you do and will do to enable all of us to move forward fast. Thank you.